God has a message just for me. Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, we're gonna start in verse nine. And I'm gonna read this to you. It says this, now when he, speaking of Jesus, departed from there, he went into their synagogue. Behold, there was a man with a withered hand. And they asked him saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? Then Jesus said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out of much more value than is a man than a sheep. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he looked at the man with the withered hand and said, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored as a whole as the other. I believe that God has a calling on your life. Regardless of the conditions that you're facing right now, I believe that God has a destiny and a purpose for you. And you might have felt held back in this past season, but I believe God is gonna do something supernatural in your life where he begins to release the constraints over you and propels you into purpose where you see him do more through you than you ever thought imagined. I believe that it's time to receive more calling. In, in fact, I want you to say this over your life right now. I want you to say, I have a huge calling. Say it out loud. I have a huge calling. Come on. I want to pray for you as we get into this today. Father, I ask in Jesus name that every person that's watching and listening would receive a word from you. God, that you would awaken destiny and purpose in us. And God, that we would walk out of here completely transformed. That wherever we're watching right now, God, as we receive this into our spirit, God, that you would begin to show us the plans and the purposes that you have for our lives. And God, give us the grace and the strength to step into them and stretch out so that we can experience the fullness of all that you have for us. Come on, if you believe that and receive that, say amen, amen. Put your hands together wherever you're at. Say, I receive it. Put it in the chat. Say, I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. More calling. Come on, are you guys ready for more calling in your life? This, this is the number one question that I get as a pastor is, is how do I discover my calling in life? How do I develop my purpose and my destiny? I, I have people ask me this question all the time. And I think the major reason why people ask me this question is because I've understood my purpose since I was 16 years old. Now, before then, I had no idea what I was gonna do with my life. If you're a teenager right now and you're like, I have no idea where I wanna go to college, what I wanna do for, for my future. Listen, you are in good company. Most of us, come on, we did not know what we were doing at that time, but I, I was in that boat. I had no idea what my future looked like. In fact, I didn't want to go to college. I had no aspiration, no ambition in my life until I met Jesus. Come on. When you meet Jesus, he changes everything. He took this down and out, depressed, messed up kid and gave him a calling in life. And ever since then, I've known exactly what it was I was called to do. Now, there have been different seasons in my life that looked differently than what I expected. This being one of them right now. I, but, but at the end of the day, I knew what the heart behind my life's calling was. I knew that God called me to ministry. I knew he called me to make an impact in people's lives. And so when you have that kind of clarity in your life, it anchors you no matter what the season you're in. You, you just know where you're going. And, and, and because I've had that clarity in my life, people have always asked me, how can I get that type of vision? How can I begin to understand my purpose in life? And I always give them the same advice. The first thing I ask them to do is I ask them to ask themselves, what has God been speaking to me? And I want you to ask that question to yourself today. If you're watching and wondering the same thing of all these people, how do I discover and develop my purpose? What has God been speaking to you? 
Now, if you don't have an answer to that question, that's probably the most important change you need to make in your life right now. Because God has something to say about your future. God has a perspective and an opinion. In fact, he's ordered your steps. And so if you don't know what God is saying over your life right now, you need to start listening to his voice. Come on, you need to get in his word. You need to get in a small group. You need to get in church. You need to start filling your mind with the word of God so that you know what he's saying about your future. The second question I always ask is, what are the passions, abilities, and opportunities that God is presenting to you? In our church, we have a saying for where all of these three things kind of come into play, your passions, your abilities, and your opportunities. When all three of these things intersect, we call it the sweet spot. Your passions are simply the things that you love to do. You feel passionate about. Maybe it's the thing that makes your heart break. It's the thing that keeps you up at night. What's your passion? But then what's your ability? Come on, some of us have passion for things that we're not so gifted in. Come on, let's just be real. I mean, I got all these worship people up here, incredibly gifted and talented. Okay, well, I mean, the majority gifted and talented in music, but but just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean that God's giving you the gift to do it. So what are the gifts and abilities that God's put inside of you? And then what are the opportunities in life that he's opening doors for? Sometimes those opportunities start small. Like I felt called to preach when I was in Bible college, but nobody was asking me to preach at their church. But just because there wasn't an opportunity to preach in front of people, didn't mean there wasn't an opportunity for me to take steps to do what God was calling me to do and be obedient. That might've looked like a Facebook video, a YouTube channel. That might've looked like preaching in my mirror. Come on, that's often what it looked like for me. But what are the gifts and talents, abilities, passions, and opportunities that God's given you? And then lastly, this, inqu- this question is really important. What is something that you would be willing and excited to work hard for? Because it's one thing to do something when it's convenient. It's another thing to do it when it's not easy, when it's challenging, when all odds are stacked against you, but you've got this inner drive that no matter what, if fa- what I'm facing in front of me, I am going to be willing to work for this because God's called me. And no matter what it looks like, I believe that God is calling me to it. And so I ask these questions. And oftentimes what I've found in people's journey of purpose and calling is that it's not so hard to discover purpose. It's not so hard to discover what it is that God's put in your heart. That's the easy part. I know for you, you might be like, I I still don't know. I'm telling you, once you discover what your purpose is, that's the easy part. You've got the easy part accomplished, but but developing that purpose is where it begins to get challenging. Because to discover purpose means I simply do some, some soul searching. I ask the Lord, I get around people. But to develop purpose means I got to start putting some work into it. Like we all love the process, the beginning of it, where we, we dream journal and we vision board. We start an Instagram account. Come on, we launch our YouTube channel. All of that's exciting because we're starting it. You know, we're, we're envisioning and dreaming. It's not real then. But what happens when it gets real? What happens when you've dreamt and you've envisioned and now the only thing that's left is to start developing that purpose. And I think this is where most people get hung up. And what I've found is that for each of us on our own individual journeys, we each have one hang up that holds us back. It may be different for you than it is for the person sitting next to you, but we all have a hang up that holds us back from pursuing our callings. For some of us, it might be time, right? You've, you've got a regular job. And so because you've got a regular job, you don't have all the time in the world to put in to the calling and the purpose that God has given you. Maybe you've got kids. Maybe you've got a family. Maybe you've got all these other things going on in your life and you just don't have enough time to invest into developing your calling. Maybe it's money. Maybe you just don't have the finances at your accessibility to launch out into that calling and to really take risks. 
And so to be able to do what you feel called to do, you need money to start that business, to launch that program, and you just don't have the finances. Maybe for some of you, it's confidence. Come on, I think we all struggle with this. God's called me to do something, but I'm not very confident yet. I don't have a following. Nobody wants to hear what I have to say. Nobody wants to buy what I'm selling. Nobody cares to listen to me. And so I'm struggling with the confidence to step out in faith. Maybe it's traction. Maybe you've been doing what you've been doing for a while but you haven't hit traction yet. Traction is when the tires grab onto the ground and you start moving forward and you've been spinning your wheels for a while, but nothing's changing. The business isn't growing. Your Instagram, your Instagram account is still at the same number of followers. Things aren't progressing. And so you're struggling. We all have that one hang up that holds us back. And I think what happens for many of us is we allow the setbacks in life to cause us to settle in our callings. Have you ever done that before? Where you face setback after setback and because you're struggling with the setback, it's caused you to settle just a little bit. Like you began this process believing big, but now you're settling for less. I wonder if today you're in survival mode. I wonder, I was thinking about this today because we, we love those shows, you know, Survivor Man. Even the show Survivor, like we love watching other people survive in crazy situations. I think we admire people who know how to survive in crazy situations. But let's be honest, we don't aspire to be those people. We admire survivors. Right? We love to hear their stories. We'll watch shows about them. But we aspire not to survive. We aspire to thrive. We aspire to grow and to progress, to do everything that God has called us to. And I believe this is a desire that God placed in us. The scripture says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God comes, come on, help me, to give life and life abundantly. Listen, God came and called you to a life of abundance. I didn't say easiness. I said abundance. God created you to live a fulfilled life, to live a life of purpose, gripped by calling, knowing that what you're doing is beyond your carnal fleshly wisdom, but it's supernatural, it's divine, that God placed his hand on your life. He wants you to live an abundant life. But many of us, we allow the circumstances and the setbacks of life to cause us to settle for survival mode. And I think that's exactly what's happening with the man with the withered hand. I believe this man that Jesus finds in the synagogue has struggled his entire life. And because he struggled his entire life facing setback after setback, he has now learned how to settle in survival mode. But for us to really understand his situation, I think we need to first empathize with his condition. Because it's easy to look at somebody's situation and judge it from the outside. It's not easy to put yourself in their position and really empathize with their condition. The Bible says that he had a withered hand. And as I did some study into this, I found a few things that can enlighten us to his situation. First of all, what we know about him was that this condition was not a recent disaster. It was a lifelong disability. In fact, many of the gospels talk about this man and the Greek language that's used to describe his withered hand denotes that it was a lifelong condition, not a recent situation. So some people believe that maybe it happened while he was working, maybe something crushed his hand and that caused this, this, this dysfunction or this disability. But based on the language in the text, we know this is something that he struggled with from birth. It might've even been a defect that he was born with and he struggled with it his entire life. Now, 
His condition was not life-threatening, but it was life-altering. There's a difference. His issue wasn't life-threatening. It wasn't this immediate, urgent matter, but it was life-altering. That got me thinking this week about how many times we downplay people's drama and dilemmas in their life just because it doesn't look like a disaster to us. Well, that's not real. That's not a real problem. Oh, come on. You're making a bigger deal out of it than it is. It may not be life-threatening, but it's life-altering. And there are things that people are struggling with that just because it doesn't seem like it's an urgent matter doesn't mean it's not an important one. This affected his entire life. In fact, Luke Luke chapter six, verse six tells us that it was his right hand that was withered. And in the Hebrew history, the right hand had a lot of significance. First, it was your working hand. It was the hand he would have used to be able to progress in his career, in his purpose, It was believed that the left hand was unclean. The right hand was working. The right hand was something that would allow you to move forward in life. And this was the hand in which he had a disability. Not only was it his working hand, this hand would be used for greeting other people and blessing his descendants. Not only could he not work the way he wanted to, but whenever he would greet people, he would have to greet them with the worst part of him. Have you ever felt so exposed and embarrassed by the weaknesses in your life that you didn't even want to meet new people? God forbid you introduce yourself and they see who you really are, so you isolate yourself and you hide yourself away. Not only was this embarrassing. It was debilitating to his legacy because the right hand would be the hand in which you laid upon your son to release legacy to your descendants. And he couldn't even pass down wealth or success to his children. It might not have been life-threatening, but it most certainly was life-altering. He was deemed as deficient or unclean But people made excuses for him because at least he had one working hand. It's not a big deal. Come on. I mean, you got one working for you. It could be worse. Come on, you could live somewhere else. You could be in a different city, a different nation. You could have it so much worse. And when we choose to judge somebody from the outside, without ever living on the inside, so often we misunderstand what that person's really going through. And I think that it's in that place of dysfunction. The word dysfunction literally means that something isn't working the way it's supposed to, that it's really difficult to keep dreaming. When you've been stuck in dysfunction for so long, it's so difficult to dream because you're so used to simply surviving. You don't have time to dream. Come on, you don't have money to dream. You don't have people around you to give you the benefit of the doubt to dream. You, You gotta survive. And so when you've been living in this type of dysfunction, it keeps us from dreaming about the destiny that God really wants for our lives. Just this week, Me and a few guys from our staff, we went snowboarding. And as we were going down the mountain, one of them, Josh, was the newest one to snowboarding. And and one of the moments as we were going down the mountain, he fell for the first time. And I looked at him, I said, you got to get up right away and keep going. Why? Because the more you fall, the less risks you're going to take. The more you feel that pain, the more you're going to avoid making progress. And you can't make progress without dreaming, without taking risks, without stepping out in faith. And so get back up. Don't get into survival mode. Don't settle for this. You got to stand back up and get down the mountain. And I think many of us right now, we're stuck in that place. 
because we face setback after setback after setback. And I think we're struggling in survival mode when it comes to our calling, believing that maybe this is just what life's supposed to be. Maybe this is just, I'm just supposed to work a job, just supposed to get home, put my time in, put my kids to bed, and that's all it's ever gonna be. But you know what I love about this guy in this scripture? He was looking for help. He was looking for an answer. Even after years struggling with this, he was searching for help. The Bible says he was in the synagogue. He was hanging out in a place where he could find answers, where he could receive a solution to his struggle. He was looking for help. And I believe there's somebody that's watching right now. You don't know what the answer is for your life. You don't know what's coming next. You don't know what's happening, what God is doing in and through you. But at least you're here. At least you're watching. At least you're presenting yourself saying, you know, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm open. I'm open to receive whatever God has to make a change in my life. He was looking for help. But the solution that he was searching for wasn't finding him. The Bible says that this guy's in the synagogue. I mean, if he's going to be in any place for change, it would be in church. Come on, let's pray for you. Let's believe for breakthrough in your life. Come on, let's, let's meet. Let's have one-on-ones. Let's get some coffee. Let's talk about how we can make some changes. Let's make a plan. And yet the Bible says he's hanging out in the synagogue and he still hasn't found his answer. And it's on the Sabbath that he hangs out at the synagogue because that's when people go to church. The problem is, is that the law only permits people to get healed on the Sabbath if it's a life-threatening issue. And so, so he's looking for an answer. He's looking for a solution. So he's going to the one place he thinks he can find it. I'm going to go to church on Sunday. I'm going to be there. I'm going to ask somebody to pray for me. The problem is, is that this religion had all these rules that kept you from doing things on certain days. And the law said it's not permitted to heal on the Sabbath, only if it's life threatening. And you just don't pass the test of what we're looking for. You don't meet the requirements for life change. You, you, don't, you don't match what we're looking for to put somebody on stage and to show their testimony. You just don't have enough. Have you ever felt like that? That you just didn't meet the requirements for life change. Everybody else is getting their answer, but you show up from time to time, Sunday after Sunday, and you're not experiencing change and you're praying and believing, but you keep getting pushed back and set back. And I believe this religion was a system intended to keep him bound because it was convenient for itself. It's convenient for us to have you around struggling with your problems, but never facing a, finding a solution. Because if you find a solution, oh God, you might leave us behind. This man was searching for something and he couldn't find it. And it started to remind me of all the conversations that I've had with people that are believing for changes in their life, but they're not willing to change their environments. Did you know that your environment will determine your outcome? who you hang around, who you spend time with, the circumstances, come on, the surroundings, the environment that you place yourself in. You're wondering why you're not seeing positive effects in your life, yet you're surrounding yourself with negative people. You're wondering why you're not making any changes that last, but the people that you're hanging out with every time you try to make a change, they remind you of your past and drag you back into it. Maybe you need to change the environment you're in to see the changes God wants to do in your life. And let me tell you, religion will never produce that kind of change. Religion will never produce that kind of change. Why? Because religion is not about transformation. Religion is about chaining you to all these rules, do's and don'ts, performance, and holding yourself to a, an impossible standard. But relationship with Jesus. Come on, true connection with Jesus 
can change everything. And maybe, maybe you need to stop working so hard for the people that have been working against you. Maybe you need to stop seeking after those who have been ignoring you and start seeking after the one the Bible says has been seeking after you. Jesus was on the move. And this Sabbath day, this one day in the synagogue was going to be different because a savior walked into the room. Come on, not religion, but the real Jesus Christ, the real God of all gods. He walked into the room and everything changed. I believe the enemy wants you to believe that your assignment and your calling is not essential. And you could just put it on the back burner. Come on, it's not important. It's not life threatening. Come on, don't believe for more. Just stay where you are. You're surviving. That's more than most people. And he wants you to believe that your calling is not essential so you can become apathetic with your expectations. But I'm looking for a people who are hungry for more. I'm looking for a people who say, I know what God's word said for my life. I'm not settling for survival. I'm going to believe for more calling. You see, to everyone else, this issue was not essential. But to Jesus, it was of utmost importance and urgency. And I came to tell you today that your calling is crucial to God. Your calling is crucial to the God who created you. When the world wants you to settle, God wants you to succeed. When the world wants to downplay you, God wants to upgrade you. When the world wants you to stay stuck in the struggle that you've been in, God wants to speak something better over your circumstance and your situation. He wants to strengthen you by his spirit. The problem is, is that we've been influenced by our environments. And now we've grown accustomed to believing that our issues are inconveniences to God. Have you ever felt like that? I don't want to pray about that. Because come on, does God really care about this? This issue is so small. It's just an inconvenience to God. I think many of us have gotten into this mindset and recently I was watching this, this mini series about the disaster that happened in Chernobyl. If you've never heard of what happened in Chernobyl, Chernobyl city in Russia, where there was a nuclear plant that exploded and released radiation for thousands and thousands of miles that affected people literally for years and years and years. It was a massive disaster. And as I was watching the behind the scenes story of this situation, I learned a few things. I learned that there were a few scientists that knew that there were issues that had not been resolved. There were problems that were not being addressed, but they had a supervisor that had somebody in charge that didn't want to hear it because to pay attention to those issues would mean slowing down the process of progression. It would reflect poorly on them as a leader And they really just wanted to get it done so they could report to their bosses that they were successful and the mission was accomplished. And so moment after moment, they would run these tests to make sure that the nuclear reactors worked correctly and the test would fail. And these scientists knew there were issues, but they couldn't bring those issues to their supervisor because those issues were treated as inconveniences. After a while, you know what they did? They just stopped bringing it up because there wasn't a safe environment for them to approach their leaders with the issues. They had become silenced because they'd been gaslighted for so long, hearing that this is not important. In fact, this is an inconvenience to what we're trying to accomplish. And I began to think about how many of us view God the same way that these scientists viewed their supervisors. That that God doesn't want to hear about my issues because, because if I bring my issues to God, it's going to get in the way of what he's really trying to do. He's going to be mad at me, disappointed at me. He's not going to accept me. He's not going to love me. So we've learned to see our issues as inconveniences to God. 
But you know what the scripture says? I want to read this to you because this is so important for your perspective when it comes to pursuing after God. Hebrews 4.16 says this. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He didn't say to find grace when everything is going great. He said, when you're needy and when you're weak, when you're struggling and you've got issues, know this, your issues are not an inconvenience to God. In fact, he sees your issues and he welcomes you in and says, come boldly to receive what it is that you need. Your calling is crucial to God. So stop letting your issues keep you from approaching him with expectation. Some of us, we've gotten in our own heads. We're saying, well, I, I can't come to God like this. Come on, he called me to do ministry. And I haven't even said anything yet. I haven't even told people. I haven't posted anything. I haven't shared anything. Stop keeping yourself from God because you're in your own head about your own issues. God already knew what he was getting into when he called you in the first place. He already saw all the insecurities, all the inadequacies. And listen to me, God is for you, not against you. Here's the crazy thing about this man. Remember, his situation was not life-threatening. And to heal on the Sabbath would have meant Jesus violating the religious law. So he could have waited one more day. I mean, come on, we could heal him on, on, on Monday. We could heal him on Sunday. We could heal him on the next day. Why break the law and do it now when I could simply heal him tomorrow and keep everybody happy? Jesus is telling us something through this miracle that it was more important for him to restore somebody than it was for him to play into this religious system. And I believe the same is true over your life. God cares more about your calling than sometimes you do. And I think for many of us, we've struggled believing it because we see God in a way that's not true to his character. Look at what Jesus says in verse 11. He said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Now, Jesus gives a life-threatening situation. This sheep falling into a pit, if I leave it overnight, it'll get eaten, it'll get killed. It's not the same situation that we're dealing with right here, but it shows us how Jesus perceives this man. You see this as secondary, but I see it as primary. You see this as something we can put off till tomorrow. I see this as something I want to deal with right now. He says, this man is so much more important than the sheep. And some of you have been seeing yourself as secondary. Something that God would settle for to deal with tomorrow. But today, right here and right now, through me, God wants to speak to you and say, your calling is crucial. He cares for you more than all the other things happening in your life. God values you. No matter your condition, you have a calling and God sees it. That calling though, it requires confidence. And I think what many of us struggle with is not simply the confidence with God that he would care enough to reach into our lives and bring transformation. I think some of us are simply struggling with the confidence to step out and make ourselves available. Because stepping out means exposing the issue that I have. And listen, if you're ever going to do anything that God calls you to, it's going to require confidence in your life. Confidence in who he created you to be. Confidence in what he placed in you. Confidence even in your weaknesses. And maybe right now, the reason why we don't step out and grow is because we're so afraid to step up 
and fall. Confidence can be a complicated issue, especially when you're struggling with confusion in your life. Confusion as to what direction I'm supposed to go and what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to move forward. Maybe you're just confused because you've been stuck in this season for a long time and now all of a sudden God is giving you hope and you're wondering, where were you all these years? Come on, can we, can we just think about what was going through this man's mind for a second in the synagogue? Well, Jesus, if I'm so valuable, why did you wait this long to show up? Why was I born this way? Why have I struggled with this my entire life? Why did you let me walk into the synagogue Sabbath after Sabbath and hear the snickering and the criticisms to be ignored, to be ostracized? Why did you let this happen all these years? This weakness that you say you wanna work with right now it's making me doubt your will to begin with. I wonder how many of us feel that way right now because there's been something you've been struggling with, an insecurity, an issue, a problem, an insufficiency. And because that weakness has been something you've lived with, it's gotten you to question God's will over your life. Well, I mean, if I was born this way, if I've been struggling with this, how can I even believe you when you say that you have great plans for me? And I believe God spoke this so clearly to me this week, that your weaknesses actually reveal God's will for your life. Our weaknesses have a way of exposing what God actually wants to do in and through us. But sometimes it's really difficult to see it when you're stuck. When you've been stuck in something for so long, come on, it's a struggle to see it any differently than the way you've seen it for years. But I wanna speak to somebody who feels stuck right now. Just because you're stuck doesn't mean that God was the source of it. But it's so easy to blame God, isn't it? Come on, I mean, God is sovereign. God's in control. So if he's God, these obstacles that I've been dealing with in life must be attributed to the one that's in control. Therefore, we start letting the obstacles of life get us offended with God. I wonder if that's where this man was. He'd been dealing with this issue for so long that in his heart, he's allowed it to build a fence with God. Oh, it started as a fence towards the people of God. I walk in here every Sunday and y'all don't do nothing. Y'all won't pray for me. Y'all just let me walk in and walk out. But then when those people don't pay any attention to us, we just start projecting that on God. Well, maybe this is God's fault. Come on, God made me this way. You let this happen to me. Everybody else got calling. Everybody else found purpose and I'm struggling with pain. And so we let these obstacles and these issues turn into offense. I'm spending time in church, but nothing is changing. I'm trying to talk to God, but I'm not seeing any transformation. I'm stepping out in faith, but I'm still struggling. And, and, and this is where we face the crisis of faith that many of us have found ourselves in throughout this past year. The crisis of faith, where what I've been taught to believe, I am now struggling to even accept that it's, that it's a reality. It's the crisis of faith where I've got more questions than answers where I'm seeing my weaknesses and I'm questioning God's will. How could you be a good God and let these horrible things happen in my life? How could you be a healer and let me get diagnosed? How could you be the God of abundant life and let us walk through miscarriage? And now 
I'm having a crisis of faith and I'm blaming it on God. But, but here's the reality. God was never the one who moved. And I know it's so difficult to see it that way because we see our life through the lens of our circumstances, our struggles and our weaknesses. But I think it's in this place where when our faith is shaken and we're not sure anymore of what to believe, that this crisis of faith becomes an opportunity for us to truly confront our convictions. Do we really believe it or are we just regurgitating it? The moment that life starts to get shaky around me, do I start to waver in my faith? And the moment that I start to waver and I start to feel weak, is that God's will? Or is that because we live in a fallen world and we are clinging day by day to the hope of an eternity with God? The truth is God didn't get you into this mess, but God sure can get you out of it. I don't know what lie you've believed in your life that now because you're struggling and you've got these weaknesses, that these weaknesses originated from God. But your weaknesses didn't originate from God. They attract God to us. You see, we all have weaknesses and issues in our lives. We all have moments where we feel like failures. We all have moments where we experience the fall. But it's in those moments that Jesus steps in and enters into our mess to reveal that he is the miracle working God. He didn't originate the mess, but he enters into it. And he begins to confront those things that the devil used against us to affirm that God is for us. Because as soon as he shows up, he reveals his will concerning our weaknesses, his grace. The moment that he exposes the issues in our lives, Jesus comes in and he says, how much more do I care about you than all of these things happening out here? How much more am I willing to pursue you and put everything on the line for the sake of restoration and reconciliation and a healing in your life. These are the moments that God uses to reveal his will to us. And it's his grace. Look at this in Matthew chapter eight, when Jesus finds the man with leprosy and the man comes and kneels before Jesus. And he says, Lord, if you are willing, come on, here's that will again. I'm struggling to believe your will. I don't know if it's your will that I would live in fulfillment and abundance. But if you are willing, make me clean. It says Jesus reaches out his hand, touches the man with leprosy and says, I am willing. Be clean. You see, God allowed your weaknesses to be exposed so he could reveal his will towards you. And that is grace upon grace, upon grace. God did not originate the issue and the weakness in your life, but he sure is willing to enter into it and bring his grace to transform and to change those areas if you would allow him to touch the places in your life of trauma and pain and difficulty and weakness. God has a greater calling for your life But that greater calling requires a greater capacity. And this man was struggling with capacity. He only had one working hand to be able to do what God wanted him to do. And Jesus saw purpose in him when he didn't see it in himself. But for him to move forward in the calling that God had for him, he was going to need to increase his capacity to pursue that calling over his life. 
And so Jesus says to him, stretch out your hand. I don't know if you catch that, but this man has a withered hand. That's not possible. That's painful. That's problematic. You're putting me on blast, Jesus. In front of all these people, you're asking me to stretch out the very thing that I'm struggling with? Stretch out your hand. I heard this all the time growing up in my house. In fact, my father was a physical therapist. And so we would often have people over to our home in his office that had just gotten out of surgery or was, were recovering from some sort of injury. And they came to my father for physical therapy. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a physical therapist, but if you have, you probably hated them because physical therapists are not your friends. They make you do stuff that is very uncomfortable. In fact, people would come to my dad thinking that he was gonna do a quick adjustment, give him a quick fix and send them off. And he's like, sorry, physical therapy doesn't work that way. In fact, what's going to happen is I'm going to put you through an excruciating process to stretch out the thing that you've been strained in. You got a knee surgery. I'm going to put you in this machine that's going to slowly stretch out your knee. And then after you struggle with me, I'm going to send you home with more stretches to do. And he would give them printed out papers of all these stretches that you had to do on your own. And if you didn't do them, you didn't move forward. And he would know about it because you would come in and he'd ask you, did you do those stretches? And they'd all lie saying, yeah, I did them. And they said, okay, show me. And they wouldn't even know how to do the stretches, much less have the mobility to move beyond where they were able to move before. And he would say this, He would look at them and he would say, if you want change in your life, you must learn to get into the motion of change. Because if you don't know how to stretch, you will stay where you are. And I want you to know this, that your solution requires a stretch. I know you don't want to hear that. I know you just want God to do it all for you. Come on, wouldn't it be so much easier? Wouldn't it be so much better? Wouldn't it feel so much greater if God could just reach in and do it? Come on, he's God, right? He's the God of miracles. He's the way maker. We sing these songs. Come on, Jesus, just do it. But when God calls you into something, he always requires a stretch towards it. If God said it, that he requires you to stretch it. God's job is to give you the vision of purpose. But it's our job to step out in faith and to stretch beyond what we are capable of doing to see it happen in our lives. Like, you know, people say this stuff all the time. I I see it on Facebook memes. God won't give you more than you can handle, brother. Lies. I don't know where you found that. I know the scripture you're trying to refer to and you're twisting it. But every man or woman of God in scripture that did what God was calling them to do had to stretch beyond their current capacity. Moses, I can't do it. I got a speech problem. Go ahead and do it. Step out and speak. Abraham, I will make you a father of many nations. I don't have any kids. Go out and do it. Step out in faith because I'm going to give you a multitude of inheritance. I'm going to multiply you beyond what you could ever imagine. Esther, I'm going to make you a woman of significance. You're going to save a nation. I'm a a servant. They they literally want to kill me. How am I ever going to do? Well, God, go out and do it. Get in line and watch the king choose you. Whenever God calls you to do something, he calls you into something you could not accomplish in your own strength. That way you have to rely on the spirit of God 
to step into it, to stretch beyond your capacity. Stretching is not fun. Come on, I tried yoga once. I learned things do not go that way. It just was not good for me. It hurt. It was painful. But stretching is necessary to get you into a posture of progress. Because that's what God does when he speaks to you. God will give you a preview of purpose and require that you get into a posture of allowing God to stretch you beyond your current capacity. But you won't see the miracle until you're willing to move. I'm seeing this a lot right now. In fact, it's probably one of my biggest pet peeves. People post this scripture online all the time. And it's this famous story in Exodus chapter 14, where God has delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. And they got the Egyptians behind them. And they got the Red Sea in front of them. And they're freaking out because they got nowhere to go. And they're waiting on God to do a miracle. And so I see this verse has been posted a lot lately. Exodus 14, verse 13, it says, Moses answered the people. He gave them this hyped up message. He said, don't be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord today. The Egyptians that you see behind you, you will never see again. Don't you worry. The Lord will fight for you. All you need to do is be still. Wow, that sounds so good. False. We post this stuff all the time. Just wait on God. He's going to move on your behalf. But we don't read the next verse. Read the next verse. Look at what Jesus says. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move. I gave you a word. I told you, you got a calling. I said I was going to bring you to the promised land, but you're waiting on another word. What I gave you was enough. Now you got to stretch out your hand and move into the impossible, believing that by my spirit, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, you can walk into the water of impossibility and see me do what I promised I would do. Maybe you haven't seen the miracle because you haven't been willing to move forward. There's so many people, they're saying, I'm waiting on God to reveal to me what my purpose is, to tell me what the next step is. And Jesus looks at the man with the withered hand, paralyzed, and he says, go ahead and stretch it out. I can't do that, Jesus. I don't have the strength. He said, oh, I'm going to give it to you. As you take a step of faith, every moment you push, I'm going to release my strength in you. And the Bible says that as he stretched out his hand, he was restored just like the other. You might not feel ready, but God in you. Come on, you might not have the money, but God in you. You might have only a little bit of strength, but God in you. You might be rough around the edges, but God in you. You might be young, but God in you. I believe God in you is greater than anything you face, any struggle, any weakness. It's no match for the strength of the Spirit of God. But you gotta stretch it out. If you want more calling in your life, it requires a greater capacity. And for greater capacity, you have got to stretch beyond your current condition. Wherever you are right now, I want you to stand to your feet because God is speaking clearly to you that he's given you a calling and a purpose. He created you for abundant life to fulfill something that is divine destiny. And he spoke it over you when he wrote that scripture. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. Come on, you've got a calling, you got a promise in this word. 
Now it's time to stretch. What are you doing to stretch beyond your current situation? How are you stepping out and moving forward? You might feel like you're at the edge of the water. You're past behind you and impossibilities in front of you. But as you step, the Bible says that with every movement forward, the water began to push back and split apart. Why? Because a step of faith always invites a supernatural solution. So how are you going to stretch this week? What are you going to do to step into the calling that God has given you? Maybe it's to launch that brand. Maybe it's to start that business. Maybe it's to post a video on, on Instagram. Maybe it's to reach out to a few people. Maybe it's to host a My Five small group. Maybe it's to start volunteering at church. Maybe it's to invest in yourself and go back to school. Maybe it's time to start trusting God with your finances and begin giving. Whatever it is, it's time to stretch. And when you do, watch the Spirit of God give you strength that you never had in yourself. I want you to know this, your calling is crucial to God. He was willing to put everything on the line, not put off till tomorrow, but to do today. And right here and right now, God cares about the smallest detail of your life. But he's asking that you would not get offended by the issues of life, but see God's will through your weakness that he's come to give you life. He's come to reconcile and restore everything that was stolen from you. But your solution requires a stretch. I want you to commit today to stretch your faith in God and do something that you couldn't do on your own. But by his spirit, you'll see a supernatural solution. I want you to put your hand over your heart, bow your heads and close your eyes with me as I pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh, I pray over every person right now who has a measure of faith in their life. Something today was sparked inside of them and they're beginning to see, they're beginning to sense that there's a greater calling over their life. But God, I pray right now, by your spirit, you would give us the grace to believe in that calling, to step out and stretch out beyond our current condition so that we can see the supernatural hand of God move in our lives. I declare right now, where there's been confusion, a spirit of clarity in Jesus' name. Where there's been weakness, the will of God in Jesus' name. Where there's been a struggle, the strength of God in Jesus' name. And where there's been issue and insecurity, I declare the affirmation of the Holy Spirit over your life. So God, right now we say yes. We commit to the stretch this week that we're gonna go beyond what we can do in our flesh. It may not make sense in the natural, but I know that you're working in the supernatural. So God, speak clearly to us as we gather with our groups, as we talk amongst ourselves. Give us clarity and accountability to move forward in this season. We receive it. We thank you for it. We praise you, Jesus, and we bless your holy name. And it's in that mighty matchless name we pray. Everybody said amen and amen and amen. Come on, wherever you are, put your hands together as an act of receiving and agreement that this is the week that we see the stretch of God's solution in our lives for greater calling. Hey, at our church, we've made it easy for you to step in to a stretch. Orange Essentials is a great place for you to start in stepping into what God has for you. It's not only a place where you can learn more about our church, but you learn more about you. We give you an opportunity to learn about your personality, to learn about the spiritual gifts that God placed inside of you so you can use them for his glory and live a fulfilled life. So I wanna challenge you right now, if you haven't gone through Orange Essentials, ask your group, reach out to somebody. Our host will give you more information on how you can get connected, but it's a great place for you to start. I also wanna encourage you in just a moment, you're gonna get an opportunity to begin a relationship with Jesus. 
If you've never connected with God, if you've never asked him into your life, if you've never said yes to him, now is the time to stretch out your hands and receive everything that he has for you by releasing your life. And so in just a few moments, our hosts are gonna pray a prayer with you. I want you to pray that prayer out loud in full agreement, stretching your faith today and watch what God does in your life. Come on, do you receive that in Jesus' name? One more time, put your hands together. Type amen in the chat. Let's throw it over to our host, see what they have for us today. Wow, that was an incredible word. Man, something I love that Pastor Jerry just said is that your solution often requires a stretch. Come on. I know that our calling can sometimes pull out of us a stretch. It can be scary, but if you're feeling the tug of Jesus, if you're feeling like you want more out mm -hmm. of life, I want to invite you to accept Jesus into your life. If you're willing to pray this prayer with me. Jesus. Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my life. I trust you. I trust you. And I want to know you deeper. And I want to know you deeper. Lord, help me live a life. Lord, help me live a life. Worthy of the calling that you've given me. Worthy of the calling that you've given me. Lord, I repent for my sins. Lord, I repent for my sins. And I believe that you are the one that came for me. And I believe that you are the one that came for me. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' amen. name, amen. Hey, if you decided that right now and prayed that prayer, put in the chat right now, I decided, I decided, come on, yes. we want to walk through this with you. We don't want you to do it alone. And so there's three simple steps to activate your faith journey. Yeah. Step one is decide. That's what you've just yep. done right now. You took that step. You said, I want to Come invite on. Jesus into my life today. And that's so amazing. That is the best decision you could yes. ever make. So step two is grow. Pastor Jared just talked about Orange Essentials, and we are launching yeah. that class March 6th, Saturday, 4.30 p.m. here at the church. And from then on, it will be every other Saturday. So be sure you can register at e2church.com. So be sure that you're getting involved, that you're getting plugged in, and that you're growing. And step three is activate. Yes. Don't just stop at the Orange Essentials class. Activate the call God has given you Come on. by serving on our E team, by joining the E group, yeah. by so doing all four Gs. Yeah. Four Gs is something that we have here at E2 Church that just kind of recognize you as a member. And four G stands for groups, growth, giving, and gifts. And so we want you to be able to activate all of those four. Yeah, and one of them is is giving. And that's one of my favorite ones because it's what makes everything mm -hmm. we do here possible. Yeah. And if you want to give, we have a few ways for you to give. You can give on our website at e2church.com. Or if you have the E2 Church app, you can also Come give on. there. Or you can make it easy and text 77977. And you can give right there. We are so excited because giving mm -hmm. allows us yeah. to pull pull the resources together so that we can do outreach, so that we can activate, so that yeah. we can be part of my five groups and that we can do life together. And it's such a powerful way for yeah. us to impact our community. And it's all because of you. It's all because of your generosity yeah. that we're able to do what we do at E2 Church. Yeah, definitely. What you guys saw today from Love Sack and from this Come weekend on. was because of your That's generosity. right, yep. And that's so amazing. But hey, we just want to close it off and we hope to see you guys back here next week for week six Come of on. our series more. We'll see you guys next see week. You.